I'm going to start with, a, I think, a very basic question, which is about the workers themselves. Uh, there are five of them. One is a graphic designer. One, if I'm correct, is a script write writer. One is a voiceover artist. One is a whiteboard, whiteboard animator. And the last one is a social media specialist. So I was wondering, how did you find and how did you select these individuals? It was a, a long, oh, sorry, I'll start over. The casting process was a lengthy one for this uh, project. It all began a year before in the summer of 2018. And um, this was originally a project done as a commission for an institution called FACT in Liverpool, Foundation for Art and Creative Technology. And um, there was a stipulation that there be some local tie-in. So I knew that I needed at least two out of the five contestants in my project, or participants rather, that, it, that um, at least two out of five of them needed to be local to the Liverpool area in the UK. So I began by commissioning uh, three call for participant casting call flyers on Fiverr and Upwork. And these were posted all around Liverpool. And um, in, I think maybe I had them designed in the summer of 2018, they got posted in the fall. And then in January of 2019, I had an in-person casting in Liverpool where I um, interviewed about 10 to 12 people for um, an, about an hour each. And the interview ended with a psychic reading from Count Marco, the, um, the tarot card reader psychic who is featured on, on my um, reality show. And, um, and so at the end of that casting process, and I think I could probably have made a documentary just from those initial interviews. Um, so then at the end of that, I chose two people from that casting. One of them, um, you know, was excited at first, but then became too busy, I think, because of the precarious nature of the gig work that he was doing. Um, and so he stopped responding after a while, and I had to find another person Ooh. local to Liverpool. So I wanted to start with the, with the local um, participants first and then figure out who else I needed in order to have this collaborative production of the documentary mini series experimental reality show together um and maybe i should just say that it's uh, it was um so the documentary mini series slash reality show was um um the idea was that it be um a collaborative production about gig workers and that we would all make the show together in some form and um, so I guess in the end from Liverpool, I had a television script writer, Cardi, and a social media content writer, more beauty blogger PR person, <laughs> Nikki. And then I knew I had to find, um, I wanted an animator and a voice artist and a graphic designer. And so then I set about casting those three roles and that took much longer than I expected. I uh, probably was in conversation with 100 people in order to get those three. And um, in order to do that casting, I basically commissioned a gig from a few dozen people where I mm -hmm. had them review themselves according oh. to their specialty. So for instance, uh, the voice artist, Kiki, she does automated response system voice recordings that are press one for English, two for Cantonese, and so on. And so I had her, um, I sent her my casting questions and I said, please write your answers and then record both sides of the conversation. Interview yourself and try to you know, alter your voice for um, the interviewer role and the um, interview subject role. Uh, and then, you know, for the animator, I did the same kind of thing. I said, write your answers to this question and then um, animate them 
do it. Um, I want you to to uh, voice your answers and do some um, animation illustration of your answers as you would for a gig. And then for the graphic designer uh, role, I had I gave them um, um, a, a brief on what this um, reality show project idea is, and I said, please you know, come up with an idea for a logo for our for this reality show, and also provide some written the written answers to this casting interview. Um, and so basically, I um, had enormous interest when I would contact people. Everyone would said, yes, 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 I'll do it. However, it made what my what my request was, you know, for um, these gig workers to expose themselves really made no sense <laughs> to most people. So I tried to be as clear and um, speak in, you know, as plain language as I could to say, this is a documentary about you, or that's what this project would be. It's about the life of the gig worker. So this will involve exposing uh, your, your personal and career daily life. However, this just, th this labor, this form of uh, gig work where people, you know, commission a clip art logo or commission a um, corporate over for an infomercial. This is such um, anonymous labor. It's really kind of ghost work. And, and um, often people are from all over the world and their and English is not their first language. So it just, um, it did not register. It didn't really compute. However, people really are desperate for work. So everyone says yes, but then when it came, came down to it, it was freaky. I think it seemed um, sinister or creepy that I was asking um, for, you know, video meetings with people and um, information mm. about them. So, it, you know, especially the female roles were hard to fill because, um, because many um, of the female gig workers uh, had already become quite wary of anyone asking for a a video conference with them, which is against the rules of you know, mm -hmm. Fiverr and Upwork. And um, People Per Hour is a little different. You're supposed to use their internal system for, for video conferencing. Um, yeah, so it's, it, um, does, that an does that answer your question? It um, not only it answers it very well, but um, yeah, I learned a lot. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very surprised. I thought because I thought because they were creative workers, they would have been very excited to finally do something a bit different, a bit exciting, and to be talking. You know, you were you were saying a lot of what they they, they normally work on is quite corporate and a bit impersonal. I thought they would have had been excited to work with, with an artist. Um, I think the, the people that I, so the people that I found and cast in the end were excited to do this. Mm -hmm. It was just difficult to find them and, and um, difficult to get through the barrier of everyone being eager for work. So, so it took a, a, a um, it took a long time in ha having a conversation, a correspondence with a given gig worker to get to the point of um, of them, you know, being curious enough, having faith enough to um, to show up for a video conference, which was a risk for them because they could have had their profile shut down and their income. Um, was at risk by doing oh. that, and I I tried my best to do it in a sneaky way so that there was no um, there were no tracks left if Fiverr or Upwork was to to look into this later. You know, I would do a temporary link that said email me here, and then but via email we would set up a video conference. But then sometimes people wouldn't show up, or you know. The first animator um, that I that I tried to meet with 
had represented himself as a woman in his profile, but he was, and he was a man, and I, it didn't seem that this was, um, um, it seemed like this was um, mostly in order to, to um, for some reason, he thought that this would get him more work. I don't really know why, but um, he was very uncomfortable by the whole, with the whole idea of uh, showing himself. I mean, I don't, um, I don't know, how would you feel about doing a documentary about yourself? Not everybody, not everybody is game for that. It's uh, an invasive proposal. I imagine, yeah, yeah. Um, but then you took you. You seem to have taken great care of them because what makes uh, the films so interesting for the public is the self care element. Is the fact that each freelancer uh, had been given access to what is called a self-care training program to improve their quality of life and work. So I was wondering why did you want to add uh, this element to in real life? Is it because you, you wanted to make sure they felt they felt comfortable all along or was it another was there another motivation? I wanted to provide uh, these gig workers with the kind of executive coaching mm. tech enhanced um, uh, methods and techniques for improving their daily work habits and living habits and lifestyles. Um, so these are services that, uh, that seemingly people in Silicon Valley um, have access to. However, those uh, gig workers living all around the world in the in the developing world, for instance, wouldn't normally get access to this um, this very you know Google Facebook style um, coaching and lifestyle improvement. Um, so my idea was informed by reality shows um, such as Queer Eye or Say Yes to the Dress or this uh, <laughs> or Marie Kondo's show um, where, where people are offered um, lifestyle upgrades with you know, supposedly cutting edge uh, techniques. And um, my part of my thinking was... Uh, why not sort of offer the solution that you know, that is uh, available to um, upper class tech workers to mm. uh, to lower class tech workers and see uh, you know what redeemable dimensions to you know this um, to these um, forms of, you know, Goop or Bulletproof, if you're familiar with those brands, you know, Gwyneth Feltra's Goop or yeah. Asprey has Bulletproof. Um, and these are um, ways of using trackers and um, quantifying oneself and one's behaviors in order to um, cut down on your working hours and, and um, get more done in less time and become a supposedly happier, healthier being in life and work. So um, I find these things, these um, techniques to be, these so-called biohacking techniques, I find them to be uh, both effective and insidious. And the ways in which uh, um, you know, I suppose the good and the bad exist are very intertwined. And, um, and I was, it was really an experiment to see what happens when you, when you offer this form of uh, somewhat therapeutic coaching and advice. It's really kind of work therapy mm -hmm. for, um, for people spending most of their time in front of their computer or handheld device. 
Right, something we maybe should all have looked into during the pandemic then. Um, speaking of the, the pandemic, um, do you think, I mean, from what you know, um, do you think that the pandemic has made online creative works um, better or worse for these uh, freelancers of the gig economy? Because because on the one hand, they, they seem to have these very cool and creative jobs and they can do it very safely from their home. On the other, on the other hand, they are not like uh, the people who, who drive us or bring us food um, because uh, these people during the pandemic, the, the, the food delivery drivers, etc., they were very visible. And so we felt some sympathy towards them. Whereas gig economy workers work online, who are creative, they, they are invisible and they are also invisibilized. So I was wondering, has the pandemic made life uh, more difficult for them? Because I, I mean, I feel sorry for them because I, if I think about what happened during during the pandemic, at least in Europe, there were many uh, in the media, there were many articles saying, oh, you know, people who deliver your food or sometimes your medicine or if you're an old person who do, who do the grocery shopping for you, they are treated very poorly. And so people were campaigning to help them you know, get better safety nets or better pay or better insurance. And and I think we, we no one ever thinks about uh, gig economy workers re working in, in the creative sector. So, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a long question. But um, how do you think the pandemic has affected these freelancers? I think that the pandemic had uh, less of an effect on these um, creative gig workers than on the average person because they were already used to spending a lot of time alone and having uh, most of their work relations and much of their social life conducted via uh, the computer or handheld device. Um, so it was, um, less of a change for mm -hmm. I think it's the rest of us joined their lifestyle something more approximate to their lifestyle suddenly out of nowhere this was a really strange experience um or um to go through you know um right before the pandemic so it was 2019 I made this um, whole production via zoom and then I thought it was done with Zoom for a while. <laughs> and, um, and then suddenly I was back on it for teaching. And, um, and I, you know, was in touch with the participants in this project. And we were checking in with one another more at the beginning. And marveling at how strange it was that um, their way of working and their daily life and work uh, was um, suddenly the rest of us were were joining something similar to their daily experience. Um, you know, maybe it also helps to think about the what kind of creative labor uh, they are conducting, they are doing. I think that uh, Graphic designers who have gone to, who have studied graphic design, or or um, creatives who went to school, film school for animation, they um, have re some resentment towards these um, more amateur creative professionals uh -huh. who um, use a different um, type of software. Normally, they use um, software that. Um, has you know pre-existing clip art they can draw on, for instance, and um, you know this whiteboard animation. This is a, a very specific program that is made for, I would say, a prosumer, hmm. right? And it's made for um, for quickly slapping together uh, visuals for corporate use, and um, I think, you know, 
graphic designers who have gone to school for the for their um, profession. Um, their um, labor has the the value of their labor has, they feel often has been diminished by this um, emerging field. And so um, it's interesting because I think I was m perhaps more critical of the exploitative dimension of, um, of these gig platforms before I started the project. I uh, thought that it was um, quite sinister and that um, someone, you know, making logos uh, by remixing clip art um, was was having to um, be put in a high stress situation where they had to be on call all the time, like a surgeon has to be on, on call uh, because it's life or death. Suddenly um, someone who may pre have previously worked in a call center or, you know, done manual labor was in this bizarre situation where their customers were, uh, um, were, you know, corporate clients trying to cut down on costs and needing, you know, urgent revisions. And then, you know, for instance, Zahid, the graphic designer in Pakistan I worked with, um, had this story about, you know, getting a need, uh, a, an alert off of Fiverr for an urgent need for a revision on a pamphlet or a logo. And then he, and, and, the, and the client needed it right away. So he did it on the back of his friend's motorcycle and then, you know, raced to a place where he could send it. And um, I thought, you know, this is very, you know, it's almost like an absurdist brave new world we're living in where everything becomes um, urgent and there are people who are, you know, um, coerced into being on call in different time zones. However, at the end of the day, I had to, after getting to know um, Zahid and Alabi, who's an animator in Nigeria, uh, I had to check myself and my own um, uh, presumptions that, um, you know, for instance, I thought, you know, Alabi, why don't, don't you want to spend more time outside playing football uh, and hanging out with friends? You know, and this this style of work where you're where you're um, tied to your computer so often and dealing with um, with uh, power outages every day and turning on your generator and you know go, walking to the gas station to get gasoline for your generator. I I thought the, this is uh, sounds like a very difficult uh, solitary life for you. However, he he kept. Um, asserting that he feels like he's an introvert and that he likes spending time alone and he likes having the independence to um, to um, support himself financially better than he could with any mm -hmm. other occupation currently avail available to him as a 22-year-old student. Um, and he said that Often he prefers to play real player video games during his leisure time and mm. sometimes go to watch movies or get a bite to eat with friends. However, he knows himself that he's not, not a super social person. And this is what, this is the lifestyle he likes and chooses. So um, at the end, I had to acknowledge that um, despite the, what I am calling these, you know, insidious or exploitative dimensions of these platforms that pe that put people in, you know, at the beck and call of, uh, of you know, the corporate managerial class. Um, this these gig platforms at the same time were offering um, the possibility for a burgeoning creative class in the developing world and. Mm -hmm higher incomes and uh, more flexibility and perhaps more freedom. Although this is a very Western Silicon Valley idea of freedom. 
Um, but how about the gig economy workers in Liverpool? Because uh, I think it's harder for them to make good money with these platforms. Yes, it's not as good for for uh, those in the UK or US generally. Mm. Uh, it's not as uh, lucrative. However, there are plenty of exceptions. There are, you know, and I think usually those exceptions are people who have teams, which is what Z Zahid in yeah. Pakistan had. He was a part of a team of three. So, um, and that makes it more manageable and less owner, less of an onerous demand than it would be on one person, you know. That, and someone can always be on call to check things, but one person doesn't have to be all the time. The same way, I suppose, doctors in a practice together, you know, can rely on each other, and that means more freedom for 